welcome back to another video of the History of Fashion and Costume Design series. My name is Bridget and today our topic is 19th century indigenous potlatch costuming and regalia of the Northwest Coast, the Haida, the Clinket, and the Kwakwakiwak Nation. So the Haida, uh, their origin story revolves around the foam woman, the creek woman, and the ice woman all joining together to create Haida land. Uh, the Haida focused on creating their land as a tree of life. Um, so lots of cedar trees and constructing numerous cedar monuments and houses. Um, in the 18th century, Spanish explorers made contact to their land and Haida traded fur and pelts with Europe. And then unfortunately, in the 19th century, British colonial authorities colonized their land, claiming it as part of the colony of British Columbia in 1858. And here on the right hand side, I have some maps um, just to show where the Haida reside. We have the Clinket, and Clinket translates to people of the tides. Um, they're located in the temperate rainforest of southeast Alaskan coast. I have some maps over here to um, be as a visualizer. Uh, so um, here, right above where the Haida is. Um, the Clinket culture is divided into two moities, the raven and the eagle, and these forms are found on crest poles, canoes, feasting dishes, house posts, weavings, jewelry, and other forms as well. And we also have their flag down here. And the Kwakwakawak, uh, their name Kwakwakawak means Kwakwala speaking peoples and the oral origin story shares their ancestors came in forms of animals by land, sea, or underground. So this included the thunderbird, the bear, and the orca. And these three animals are widely seen and depicted on canoes and crest poles, um, house poles, and other art farms. Um, ornate weaving and woodwork were common and important crafts. Uh, both were displayed and traded at potlatch ceremonies. And potlatch is something I will um, get into and explain in a few slides. And the Kwakwakwak would trade with surrounding indigenous nations and Europeans. Um, and with Europeans trading, um, there was an influx of copper and copper was highly prized and valued by the Kwakwakwak and other Northwest Coast nations. Um, so I also wanted to add in some natural resources in fashion. So the land and waters provided rich natural resources through cedar and salmon. And the First Nations people of the Northwest Coast have a rich tradition of hats, cloaks, body armor, and masks being worn um, prior to European introduction to of cloth. Most co coastal natives wore minimal clothing. Uh, simple skirts were made of shredded cedar fiber and both sexes wore bark capes and spruce root hats were used as protection from the dense rain. Um, more inland natives uh, shirts were made of buckskin to maintain warmth and porcupine quills were used as decorative elements. Uh, necklaces were made of shell, beaver teeth, bear claws and clam shells and highly prized pieces were made of dentilium shells a slender white tusk shaped shell gathered near the shore of Vancouver Island. And I have an example here. And then I also just pulled these um, from JSTOR and we have like a typical um, coastal tribes attire and then a typical inland uh, tribes attire around this time. Um, so a potlatch, uh, to kind of explain what it is, it's a gift giving feast practiced by the First Nations of the Northwest Coast. Northwest Coast, including the Haida, the Clinket, the Kwakwakwak, and others. Um, it involves giving away or destroying wealth or valuable items, um, which would have been like the copper, and it's demonstrating a nation's power. So there's a focus or reaffirmation of families and human connection to the spiritual world. Um, and this involves dancing, singing, storytelling, uh, delivering speeches and games. Uh, potlatches were usually large celebrations held for the occasion of births, deaths, weddings, and other major events. Um, and unfortunately, from 1881 to 1951, the government of Canada made potlatches illegal in the amendment to the Indian Act. Um, and here on the right, I have these really beautiful photos of potlatch ceremonies in action. So the Chilkat uh, blanket and robe um, 
is one of the first items we'll kind of talk about. So it's a traditional form of weaving practiced by the Northwest Coast peoples of Alaska and British Columbia, including the Clinket and Haira. Uh, these blankets and robes were crafted from mountain goat or uh, more contemporary, they use sheep wool um, and yellow cedar bark strips. Um, and these would represent animals or figures from clan crests. And here I have like this little map that shows you have the mouth at the bottom, um, the head, the body, and the tail. Um, and yellow, black, and pale blue were the dominant colors for this weaving. And these were traditionally worn for potluck ceremonies as the long wool fringe would sway and move with the dancers. We can see on this bottom right. Um, and the image that I have of the Chilkat robe um, from the 19th century is actually housed at the Denver Art Museum. I wanted to include some close-up imagery that I found to be really interesting because um, you normally don't see these items close up when you go to art museums. Um, so the one on the left, um, it's a close-up view of warp strands and it reveals the cedar bark core hidden beneath the exterior of mountain goat wool. And then the right-hand image is a close-up view of the Chilkat blankets woven segment depicting this human like face um and it's illustrating the appearance of berated twining um and you can see like this raised twisted cord that defies these shapes um and women of the clinket and haida would weave these blankets yarn constructed by spinning together two strands of cord made from the plucked wool of mountain goat or um commonly today sheep uh, was utilized for the strands to be visible on the surface of the blanket known as the wefts and was woven horizontally from left to right over passive vertical strands comp comprised of a hardy core of shredded and twisted cedar bark encased in a layer of mountain goat wool and this is known as the warps and concealed in totality by the weft strands. Um, I also found these images. Um, these are housed at the Denver Art Museum of a Chilkat tunic and shirt. So on the left hand side we have the shirt um, and then on the right hand side we have the tunic and then I also included some close-ups of both um, the shirt and the tunic. And we also have um, button blankets or button robes um, and it's a wool um, blanket or robe embellished with red flannel and mother of pearl buttons. Some were decorated with abalone or dentialium shells uh, worn for ceremonial purposes. And these robes served as insignia of family or clan histories and genealogies usually worn and gifted at potlatches. And the crest design hangs on the back of the wearer. Um, there's raven bears and whales or like a few examples of designs um, incorporated. So here we have a clinket uh, button blanket with the raven crest at the Denver Art Museum. And then we have a Haida button blanket um, also at the Denver Art Museum. So you can kind of see like the differences um, in design there. Um, I also wanted to include photos of the button blanket robe also the Chilkat blanket and robe um, worn during potlatch. So here on the left-hand side, uh, these are more contemporary photos, but we have wolf dancers from potlatch in 2005. Uh, we have chief and artist Willie Seaweed, um, who lived 1873 to 1967, holding his coppers. Um, and Seaweed, he was a singer, storyteller, and great artist, uh, keeping the traditions of potlatch alive through the years as he was prohibited by law. Um, and then we also have the salmon dance, which um, was done by dancers Natalia and Kiara Child in 2012. And you can see um, one is wearing the Chilkat robe blanket and the other one is wearing the button blanket button robe. What is really important are dance aprons. Uh, to sip aprons um, were used uh, during ceremony and the Kwak 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 members recognize aprons as fundamental pieces of regalia. Aprons also also had an auditory effect when worn and danced with. So the fringe at the bottom um, being shells or puffin beaks rattle as the dancer or speaker moved. And then in the 1800s, European traders introduced uh, commercially produced textiles, beads and bells, which were then added to these dance aprons for decoration and also some stimulatory elements like um, auditory. Also, the Northwest Coast have very rich masking traditions that play a role in great feasts, um, which are the potlatches um, held to recognize and celebrate clan status. Um, each clan has their own crest or symbols visually proclaiming ownership of everything from clan names to fishing territories. And artists are commissioned to carve, paint, 
or sew clan symbols onto clan members' belongings. Uh, these masks were made from artists from different tribal groups and serve a variety of purposes. Some feature clan symbols, while others are made for specific ceremonies, uh, fashioned as portraits or created for the contemporary art market. Uh, so I have a wide variety here. Most of these are housed at the Denver Art Museum, um, but we have some on the left that are portrait masks to kind of depict ancestry or depict a living person. We have one uh, that's the Klingit sun mask from the 19th century. We have the wild man of the woods mask. Um, we have the four-faced Tamatsa mask from the Kwak 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 Nation. Um, we also have like the crane mask and then the raven mask. So we're like depicting animals and um, spirits and people and ancestors, uh, wild men of the woods. It's really beautiful. And then another thing we have are transformation masks. So the Northwest Coast transformation masks um, are manifesting transformation. <laughs> and it's usually an animal changing into a mythic being or a human becoming an animal or vice versa, becoming another. Um, so the raven, for instance, is known as a trickster and he often changes into other creatures, um, helps humans with pro providing them with a variety of useful things like elements such as like sun, moon, fire, um, and even salmon. And the Kwak 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 transformation mask depicting age and ancestry is here as well. Um, and we have uh, up above or down below, I'm sorry, on the bottom right where my mouse is. It's the Kwak 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 Eagle Mask. And when presented wide open, it presents this human face. But when the four side pieces are closed, it head of an eagle. Um, and there's like that down turning beak. Um, and the dancer would pull the strings at the appropriate moment to reenact the story of a clan ancestor transforming from animal to human. Um, which are all so amazing. And you can see these at the Denver Art Museum. They have them um, displayed like wide open so you can see the inner workings. They also have some displayed that are closed. Um, and hats and headwear were really common. So Haida hats are both functional and symbolic, uh, tightly woven spruce through to protect the wearer from weather elements. High ranking men and women would wear woven hats with painted crest images, signaling social positioning, clan affiliation. And the bottom left is the Haida hat woven by Isabella Edenshaw in the mid 1800s. I'll have my mouse circling it. Um, and her husband, Charles Edenshaw, painted the frog crest onto it. And the frog was believed to have supernatural powers that bring wealth, status, and good luck. And I also have the top of the hat here. And this was a common um, symbol for the Eden Shaws. I believe it's the um, cardinal directions that they're depicting there. So jewelry amongst the Kwakwaki Wak consisted of earrings, bracelets, necklaces, nose rings, lip piercings, and more. Um, and I have a image on the bottom left of a chief's daughter uh, shown wearing copper headpieces, alaboni earrings, um, a nose ring, and inscribed metal bracelets. Um, contact with European settlers brought gold and silver, which were hammered into desired shapes. Silver and gold jewelry were often inscribed with patterns and mythological figures, and also wooden hairpins have also been found from this time. Uh, so we have uh, two Klingit bracelets uh, with really similar patterns and engravings, um, one in sterling si silver and one in copper. And then here is um, my work cited. Um, thank you so much for joining me on this. There was a lot of information, but also not enough information. I think each of these uh, First Nations are so complex and there's so much more to deep dive into. Thank you so much.